Good morning, uh, Mr. Dossier. Good morning, Chief Justice and I, Commissioners. I, I just want to apologize to you that we're starting earlier than we should. It was, uh, hey, <laughs> this language, later. <laughs> <laughs> you knew what I meant. I know what you mean. <laughs> yes, no, 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 yes. Uh, please uh, accept our apologies no for need. keeping you waiting. No need. Um, you are a hold of a Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of Laws degrees, and higher diploma in tax law. That's correct, Chief Justice. And you started off as a prosecutor, didn't you? That's correct. For how many years, all in all, including the time when you were a control prosecutor, um, where you were a prosecutor? I uh, started off in Nigel, which is my hometown, and from there moved to Benoni, and from Benoni then uh, became control prosecutor and regional prosecutor, and at that time I was admitted as a state advocate, and that was approximately three years. And then from then onwards, I then uh, applied for a position as district magistrate in 1995, acted, 96 was appointed, and uh, then started acting in the regional court in 1998 and was appointed in 2000 in the regional court in, um, well, I did a lot of areas, uh, the whole of the East Rand, but was appointed in 2000 in Soweto. So, so you've been a magistrate for over 20 years? Um, it is 23 years as a magistrate. Yes. And um, in total, for how many months have you acted, more or less, it as is, a judge? Well, it is 55 weeks, which is about a total of about 13.7, so I'd say rounded off at 14 months. And after how long did you feel comfortable and settled in that space now, that new environment? Chief Justice, there wasn't much time to feel comfortable. My first acting stint was two weeks back to back of opposed motions. So I had to step up to uh, the workload and deliver immediately. I think my experience in the regional court, in the special, well, not specialized, but in the civil regional court assisted me immensely in preparing for that. And uh, in addition to criminal cases, I had no difficulty adjusting because the 12 years experience as a regional magistrate in the criminal courts, that equipped me. And uh, now it's about eight years in the civil regional court. Uh, it, it's equipped me and honed my skills that are required for the high court. And have you had a problem with delivering your judgments on time? I, my average is, if I had to take between the quickest and the longest I deliver at the moment, I'd say probably one and a half months. That's an average. But I do have one now that's a little over three months. It's definitely not six months, but it is over three months. Yes. Let me ask you a controversial question, and I may not ask it to others. You moved directly from being a prosecutor to becoming a magistrate. That's correct. Now, there is a belief that when you are a prosecutor, you are so beholden to the state. You are so, you lack independence so much so that it would be inappropriate for you to be appointed from the position of prosecutor to magistrate. Did you find it difficult to be independent as a judicial officer moving from the prosecution into the magistracy? Chief Justice, I didn't find that problem at all. I found the move quite easy. Obviously, the first day stepping into the shoes of, an, of, an addition, of a, of a um, judicial officer was different to being a public prosecutor, but the mindset, you adjust very quickly, and I think you immediately take over the skills that are required as, a, as an adjudicator of, of facts. Well, I know many, a, a number of countries like your Germany, France, and even Commonwealth countries like your Ghana, Uganda, they, they, they don't find a, a problem even from moving from prosecution to judgeship. But uh, there is a, a bit of a, a discomfort from some South Africans about that. What do you think, what do you think might have given a rise to the discomfort in this country, particularly in relation to 
moving from prosecution to judgeship? Well, naturally you're going to be exposed in the prosecution to several matters that, are, that have a wealth of information and obviously if you move straight with that knowledge into the position as a judge, obviously you, you could possibly be seen as being biased in your decisions. Naturally, one who, uh, who takes on that duty would have to guard against that and be aware of the Bangalore principles that you need to be impartial and you need to be uh, relatively independent, well, mostly independent, to adjudicate those matters with the skill required. But in the prosecuting authority, how does it work? Do you get instructions either from uh, or, uh, the director general or officials in the ministry or the deputy minister or the minister say, no, 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 this case, I want you to handle it this or the other way and you just follow? Or do you enjoy the independence as a professional? I would say, well, in my understanding of the law, this is what I'm going to do, this is what I'm going to do, that I'm not going to do. How does it work? Just educate us uh, briefly a bit. Well, it should work that you are uh, in task with a particular matter and certain facts and you are not supposed to be influenced by a minister to take a certain decision or for that matter, president, to take yes. a certain decision. So that's how it should work. Well, does it work that way generally or as an exception? Uh, there, <laughs> there have been uh, criticisms in this regard. Well, I, I'm none the wiser. I wanted to get a sense of whether the NPA is a professional body or whether it's just an apparatus of the members of the executive that can be told any time at every level what to do and what not to do. I'm not too sure you've helped it's us. It's a professional body and I don't think it will be dictated to by government. So should I understand you to be saying there may be exceptions though? The individuals, uh, it all depends, but as a professional body, they definitely should not be influenced by government. Okay. Now, I don't know if I asked you about how long it takes you. It, it has been taking you to finalize a judgment. What has been the longest as an acting judge that it took you to finalize a judgment? Well. At the moment, out of 94 judgments, they were always roughly in three months. As I said, I do have one now that has gone over three months. Yes. Uh, do you want to uh, boast a bit in relation to your suitability for the position you've applied for? Thank you, Chief Justice. I think it's obviously up to the Judicial Service Commission on, on the composition and aggregate of who the suitable candidates are to consider the aspects of Section 174, 1 and 2, of the Constitution. I think 51% of our um, proportion in this country is women. So I think that's a, a definite uh, important factor. However, with that, I would also ask the Judicial Service Commission to consider if there are additional spaces available to also look at uh, putting into positions of judgeship people who have certain skills to bring to the bench, people who've made a concerted effort to transformation. And I believe I have done that. Since yes. my years at university, when I was part of a singing group and went into Soweto in Orlando and enjoyed the freedom of going into Soweto in the late 80s and 90s, it dawned on me when I was appointed to the Law Students Council, which was only white in those years that we needed to change. And we did. In 1991, we made a concerted effort to appoint uh, people, well, actually it was black students, yes. to take on, basically to, to be a duplicate of the portfolio that was in, in operation. And in those years, I also taught at the street law, which was black schools. And in addition to that, I have always engaged fully in the community where I worked in, especially in Soweto. I enjoyed mm -hmm. that very much. I engaged with the youth and uh, participated purely to educate them as to what I was seeing in the courts and what was causing rape, sexual offences, so as to help them to be, to be guarded against these pitfalls that do not use drugs, stay out of this. And this carried on in my work as a magistrate in Soweto. If there were suitable 
public prosecutors, and even legal aid attorneys that appeared before me, I would encourage them, try and apply for the uh, state advocates, try and apply for the magistracy, and many did and are successfully in those positions. My ability to mentor has always been uh, carried on when I taught the legal practical school from 1996 till 2017. I taught at the University of Johannesburg, the University of um, Witwatersrand, and also at the Mill Park Legal Practical School, and taught many, many uh, black candidate attorneys. And many would come up to me and ask me, is it even good to come into the public prosecution? And I would say, yes, we need people of caliber to come in and do the job that we need to protect this country. And that is where my mentorship started and carried on. Um, in my years now as a regional magistrate, I also have assisted fully in the International Association of Women Judges in the mentorship programs that are currently being run. I was elected as a provincial executive member for Gauteng, which is usually position held for a woman, but I was appointed in that position and we have mentored 100 black uh, female final year law students last year and graduated in December. And this year we have 161 that will be graduating on the 30th of November. Um, as Gauteng, we're also doing a program with candidate attorneys to expose them and to demystify the, the high court and what is happening there. And you should be empowered and you should strive for those positions. So I, I've enjoyed that. And I think if I do not have all the skills that are fully required that other candidates may offer, I still believe that I have a vision of transformation. I have always tried to make a difference. And I have a quality in bringing my knowledge of sexual offenses and sexual violence. What is happening in this country from my commitment already in 20, um, 2006, where I was appointed on the International Association for the Treatment of Sexual Offenders. And that brought a lot of ability to me to understand what, uh, what the triggers were in these sexual offenders. It also um, probably was prior to that also um, an, a passion for me to return to Soweto as a regional magistrate. because I'd spent many years there in my early youth and I wanted to make a difference. In the years that I went there, there were a lot of uh, demonstrations of power, people opposing women abuse. And when I arrived there and started actively dealing in a specialized sexual offenses court, this changed and it stopped. We didn't have these demonstrations and, 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 and picketing outside the Protea court. And I feel that's the special quality I can bring to the bench. Uh, my knowledge of civil matters, I believe I have come up to speed because I made submissions in Parliament in 2007 to the Justice Portfolio Committee to change and bring a change to the Magistrates Court Act to introduce a civil jurisdiction in the regional court. And ultimately, I wanted to be one of the first to exercise that, and I was. Uh, before I ask the JP to step in, I just want to, for the benefit of all of us, say this. I've become aware that not everybody knows that if you are absent, a candidate comes, and uh, goes while you are out. Even if you were here when others were interviewed, you can't participate because you need to, to see how they all perform to be able to do that. So as we go in and out, let us just be mindful of that because uh, we, these things have, can escape us, you know? So just be mindful of that. JP? Thank you, Chief Justice. Uh, do you mind if I call you Dario? Please go ahead, JP. <laughs> Thanks for availing yourself for this vacancy. Um, according to your work allocation spreadsheet, mine says you've done 55 weeks acting, but I think I saw your questionnaire which says you've done 56. I don't have a problem, I'll accept 56. And uh, the bulk of those acting stints have been in the criminal trial courts. Am I correct? No, it's not, uh, JP. The mm. 24 weeks were criminal and yes. 31 weeks were civil. 
Thanks for that correction. But your overall strength and experience lies in the criminal trial courts. That is correct. I think yes. the 12 years in the regional court, yes. Yes. And, uh, but you've, did you have any problems when you were allocated duty in the civil part of the High Court? Uh, JP, if uh, any. I actually stepped up to the occasion. I had to work very quickly to get up to speed. Yes. Yes. And uh, I see you've done one, two weeks in the third court. How long did it take you to write those judgments? Uh, JP, this is the one that I actually have that I'm writing. Yes. Um, it has taken a little bit longer because it was a three-day special opposed motion. Mm -hmm. It was 1,563 pages of uh, paperwork and obviously 2,064 additional pages and bundles that were added and two additional bundles that 16 large lever files. Yes. Um, in this second term that I worked, I delivered 27 judgments and I wanted to make sure that I didn't fall behind on all the others, that everything else gets out of uh, time. So I tried to work on the ones that were... Uh, uh, shorter, let's put it that way, and I needed to fully engage on this one because it deals with constitutional issues, and uh, I have set a date now to hand it down. I see. But you didn't struggle at all? No. Because I see you've also done four weeks in the opposed motion courts. That's correct. On average, how long did it take you to write those judgments in the opposed motion court? Uh, I always try to get those done between two to three months, some are sooner. Some are given in a week, but the majority have to say probably two to two and a half, three months. Yes. And uh, on average, what was the load in each instance when you did work in the opposed motion work? Um, as to the number of opposed motions yes. per week? Yes. Um, I think this last term, uh, well, it was in the second term, I think I, I, think I had eight. Eight, it yes. Wasn't, it wasn't as much as the previous ones. Well, I think it's because there are advocates who now do pro bono work in the opposed motion courts. That's why the, the workload has decreased, right? Because I the norm is about that. 12. Yeah. I did notice that. In 2013, there was a lot more opposed yes. motions. I see you've also done 11 appeal court weeks. Did you sit in full courts? Yes, I did. And in, in I'd probably say out of those four, I think, or, or three, I wrote two of those. Yes. And uh, just for the record, you've given me one, two, three, four full terms acting. Is that correct? Yes. Right. And uh, that means you've had, except for when you were doing the criminal trial court in the first term of last year, but in the other terms, you've done a full load that a permanent judge would do. That's correct. Right. Now, just to go to one area, one more area. Sorry, Chief Justice, just one area. Just to come back to the issue about criminal law, your list of judgments suggests that you've done, um, how many judgments? 93. Uh, there was an additional one handed yes. down, so it's 94. 94. Of those, 48 have been in the criminal law area. Am I correct? Uh, that's correct, 48. And 27 of those were during the civil <laughs> terms. They were appeals. Yes. You did a stint in the urgent court. Yes. Did you write those judgments or did you hand down extempore judgments? Um, they were, I'd say, well, there was one that was written and the rest were extempores. Yeah. Now, what's your view to people who sit in the normal opposed motion court and hand down extempore judgments? I have done that mm. and I think it's good. Um, I think the more experience one gets, the, the easier it will be to do that. Yeah. You I think do that in the thing. civil regional court. Um, I think one is a little bit more, wants to be a little bit more comprehensive in the high court. Yes, but we expect you to write your judgments. Because well, of do. the problems <laughs> that litigants have in accesses, accessing the transcribed judgments, isn't it? Well, in the two that I gave extempore, those were transcribed. Yes. I actually have them. Yes, but it takes litigants longer to have access to those judgments, isn't it? Uh, to the written ones? Yes. No, yeah. to the transcribed ones, um, if they are given extempore. Um, well, it depends. If you ask for the transcribers to urgently type them up, they do. Um, but not, you, you see, I think the point I'm driving at yes. is you didn't resort to that in many instances. No. 
and uh, there's a reason for that. There's a reason to that. You wanted to write your judgments. Well, I prefer to write my judgments. Yes. I'm, a, I'm a writer and I like to make a difference. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, CJ. Thank you, JP. MSC. Thanks very much. Uh, I am covered by the, by the judge president. Thank you, MSC. Commissioner Norman. Good morning, Chief Justice. Um, good morning. Good morning, Commissioner Norman. Thank you. I just, um, you, I'm sure you regard yourself as an expert in criminal law because I've read uh, most of your judgments, which um, have actually developed uh, criminal law. But could you just tell me about the test that you created, the twofold inquiry you created uh, in the Shandrize judgment, yes, briefly. Well, yes. you know, this, this was as a result of many cases that I saw in Soweto that uh, it was very easy to acquit uh, a child uh, in, in a matter of a child rape where the child was mentally uh, disabled or mentally, uh, the correct term mentally disabled according to the Children's Act. And I wanted to make a difference to, to make it a little bit more clearer and give a bit more guideline. Basically, when you have the twofold test, it's a factual inquiry uh, as to factual consent and secondary, a legal consent. Now, yes, a child who is suffering from mentally handicapped might say yes uh, to, in, to sexual intercourse, but might not fully understand why they're saying yes. And that's where the second leg, the legal uh, consent, comes in. So if if there is no factual consent, well, then it stops there, and there should be no reason why that accused should not be found guilty. But when there is factual consent, I wanted to write specifically this next leg, you need to consider if there's legal consent. Because many of these children, whether they're 14 or even 16, are not fully developed, and they, they're easily um, uh, convinced, uh, and, and this is not a good thing. And I wanted to make a difference in writing that judgment. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Justice. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Nyambi? Uh, thanks, CJ. M morning, Advocate. Good morning, Commissioner Nyambi. If you can share with us your understanding of uh, the issue of transformation of judiciary. Well, transformation of the judiciary, it's, it's a very wide topic. Um, it uh, relates to obviously the demographics of the country according to the Constitution, Section 174. I think it goes also a further step. You need to also transform the judiciary uh, in the sense of uh, computers. Uh, you need to transform it to make it accessible to the public as fast as possible and to bring about change for communities to engage fully and understand that they have a right place in the community and also it relates to uh, transformation in the sense that uh, communities must just uh, access the law better and easier. That is my passion and my interest in, in transforming it. What is the current situation in South Africa when it comes to that? Well, obviously one of the prime examples is a Judicial Service Commission who makes appointments uh, to the judicial bench. So this is one active role that uh, the Judicial Service Commission has to do. Regarding the computerization of the courts, well, I think there's a lot that can still be done. I attended a conference uh, in Australia and was able to see many courts in Australia, how efficient the, the accessibility are for, for anyone, be it a complainant, be it a, 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 a legal representative, be it a litigant, to go into a court and just already at the entrance to the court gain so much information that they require for knowledge of this particular case. And unfortunately, we, we're moving along that line, but we haven't moved fast enough. And I think that's an important uh, part of transformation, which we, we're not there yet. And as to accessibility, we also need to have buildings that are in good condition for uh, complainants and litigants alike to access and to be to be proud to be part of the system and to be able to um, to engage fully with the law and if they are complainants to to derive the relief they are seeking thanks advocate thanks cj thank you honorable nyambi just to remind colleagues two questions unless it's strictly necessary and you ask for permission no preambles and unless it's strictly necessary and let's stick to the point. 
Thank you. It's no criticism on you. You did well, Commissioner Nyambi, by the way. <laughs> uh, uh, it's easy to be misunderstood. <clears throat> um, Honorable Maguanesh. Uh, thank you very much, uh, CJ, and good morning good to morning. you, sir. Good morning, Commissioner. In 1996, you completed your legal practice course and you passed your attorney's exam, but you did not proceed to qualify as an attorney. Why? I'll explain to you why. I, in 1994, was admitted as an advocate. I was uh, then a public prosecutor, and in 1996, I was uh, elevated to the district court bench, and I just felt I needed to round and gain more knowledge in civil law, and I wanted to write the, uh, the attorney's exam, which exposed me to all the uh, fields that are necessary to pass the attorney's exam, and I did write the exam and I passed it. But at that stage, I was sitting as a district magistrate, so I didn't go and um, work as an attorney. Thank you, CJ. Thank you, Chair. Um, Honorable Singh? No, Chief Justice. Oh, thank you. Um, President Maya? Thank you, Chief Justice. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't see him. Good morning, Mr. Dosio. Good morning, President Maya. Uh, let me first declare, CJ, that uh, Mr. Dosio and I come from the, both come from the South African chapter of, of the International Association of Women Judges. Um, I just want to commend you for the tremendous work you do. I, I know no preambles, but I'm going to ask only one question. You do tremendous work um, for the upliftment of your community, the development of its youth, and gender equality generally, and not many men can lay claim to that. Now, when you mentioned your achievements, you did not uh, tell us about the SGBV project which you and your colleagues um, in the Women Association, Women, Women Judges Association in Gauteng do. And I think um, it would do a whole lot of us you know, some good to hear about that, maybe provide some lessons. Can you tell us just briefly what that is about and what it is that you do? Yes, sure. President Maya, um, the SGBV, uh, Sexual uh, Based Gender Violence Program, was initiated, we started it in 2018, we went to a school in Timbisa. It is a project whereby we have actors and the actors are paid and they act out a particular scene which is obviously relating to a sexual crime. The children are then encouraged to partake on the stage and finish the story. So in other words, if there are certain role players that were as the perpetrator, the child is to uh, take on the role as coming to finish the story and say, look, this was not right, why did you do that? And they engage fully on stage and we give that opportunity to them to engage fully. So we are in the process, we, money was raised in this regard and we are in the process of rolling this out uh, further to more schools. And uh, obviously what I've not had opportunity to contact and, and speak to about is we've also contacted the Market Theatre who is also preparing a proposal which will also make it a little bit easier uh, because we as judicial officers would like to attend each of these programs which did take place in 2018 at the Tembisa School. And we were present, well, I, I didn't go personally, but the, the, the judges and advocates and uh, attorneys who were present spoke at the beginning of the program and just imparted a bit of their knowledge and understanding of what uh, the role of the courts is and that you have rights and bring your uh, complaints to the courts. So this is a program that will be rolled out and we hope to start uh, very soon again to continue this uh, rolling out of the program. I hope that has answered uh, what, what that's about. What do you hope to achieve? Well, I think we want to empower young women to know what their rights are and that if they are accosted or if they are placed in difficult situations, not to keep quiet, but to verbalize this assault on their person and to, to find uh, relief in coming to bring, to bring this to the attention of the authorities and not to be afraid. Uh, unfortunately, it also comes with a sense of um, social um, 
uh, backup in the sense that they might be psychologically uh, suffering. So we also need to extend this a bit more uh, with the assistance of the MEC. Uh, but the you know, other was consulted and he's also backing this program. And uh, we hope that when we do um, start rolling out the programs that uh, the social services will be on board, the psychological services, should any of these children have been affected, that they can come forward and have the necessary support that is necessary. Thank you, Mr. Dossier. Thank you, Mr. Dossier. Thank you, President. Honorable Breitenbach. Thank, thank you, Judge President, and uh, good morning, Mr. Dossier. Com good morning, Commissioner Breitenbach. Um, I just want to um, traverse something that the Chief Justice raised with you, um, and your answer was that uh, the NPA, and particularly prosecutors, should not be dictated to by government. Yes. Uh, would you agree with the statement that it's not limited to government, but uh, prosecutors should not be dictated to by anyone at all? Yes. They are a professional body that <coughs> not, stands alone. Not, not even by the national director. A prosecutor dealing with a case does so autonomously. That is and correct. nobody can interfere without very good reason. That is correct. Usually the delegation is handed down and very often they will carry on with that particular matter as they deem fit. Um, obviously then, if it is a matter that goes to the High Court, it obviously will be in the hands of the National Director of Public Prosecutions will give that mandate. But in the, in the lower courts, the control prosecutors uh, will give this uh, delegation to the prosecutors and the prosecutors go ahead and do what they must do. I hope that answers it. So if there is manifest lack of independence by prosecutors, it really isn't an inherent institutional weakness. It depends on whether or not individuals want to do the right thing or they open themselves to be manipulated or corrupted by others. That is correct. Uh, I think, Chief Justice, you know, moving towards the National Development Plan of 2030, I think corruption is an extreme uh, factor that we need to eradicate because uh, to, to balance the, um, the judicial system, just uh, eradicating inequality in the community, that has to be definitely upheld. Minister? Good morning. Uh, Good morning, Mr. Minister Lamola. Mm. Yes. Mine is um, the first one. I see you also have a lot of experience with regard to the sexual offenses court. That's correct. What, what do you think should be done to make them more effective and responsive to the and be victim friendly? and all that the intended objectives of the Sexual Offences Court. Uh, Minister Lamola, I think many years ago there was a prevalence and rollout of the Tutuzela care clinics. I think it is a multi-tasked uh, involvement of many role players who will eventually bring this uh, surge of sexual violence uh, to an end. The uh, Tutuzela Care clinics play a predominant role, and that is the first point of call where children go when they are um, violated. So the doctors there need to have specialized knowledge of uh, pediatric uh, child issues, uh, the sensitivity and empathy that must prevail with the police at first point call must be there at the Kutuzela <coughs> clinics and at the police stations. I think if that is there, the community will be more uh, willing to come forward and divulge these particular matters that are happening. If you do not have that empathy and sensitivity at the first point of call, the community will detract as they will feel they are hitting um, a wall of, of, of no sympathy and they will not engage with the police. So I think this is an important factor. And then also the judicial officers who are sitting in those matters need to be equipped to have the necessary sustenance, endurance, and sens sensitivity to these matters, because if you're not going to be able to psychologically withstand the pressure that you are exposed to when you hear these matters, 
you will probably not spend much time wanting to do these matters. You also have to have a proper understanding of children and their retention capacity. Because children get tired, you need to have these specialized courts where the children are protected. You need to have the intermediaries. You need to have the closed circuit uh, rooms where they have opportunities to go and sit in and feel protected. So it, it, it is a, um, a multi-tasked um, uh, uh, cooperation of social welfare workers as well. The teddy bear clinic plays a predominant role in the preparation of these children to empower them and give the confidence to come before the court and testify. So it, it is a lot of factors that need addressing to reach a, a, a good um, outcome. Yeah. My last question, I see you, you are one of the first uh, regional court magistrates who participated in this civil court at the magistrate uh, level. Uh, and I yeah. see, I hear now today that, uh, in fact, you, you proposed this. Uh, what do you think should be done to, to ensure that it is being used effectively for access to justice? Because it does seem that uh, practitioners still prefer to litigate at the, at the high court with the high cost for, for, for their clients and also for, for access to, to justice. Um, Minister, if I understand correctly, are you saying that some of these sex offences are being preferred to be litigated in the no, High Court? I'm, I'm no longer... I, the, oh. the one of sexual offences, I think I'm... Okay. I, I, I've established what you think should then be done. Just and please ask yeah. it to repeat, uh, maybe. The second question relates to, to the jurisdiction of the regional court right. with regards to civil matters. Right. But um, I see that you're one of the first magistrates in that civil court. Yes, Would, and um, I hear as you, as the Chief Justice was introducing you that you, you in fact propose this kind of a, of a measure. But my, my question relates to its use that most practitioners prefer to litigate at the High Court uh, and not at that level. And that also increases the cost because of the cost of litigating at the High Court, including the including the, the court role and so forth. So what do you think should be done to encourage practitioners and everyone to use the, the civil court in the district, in the regional court, not the district? Mr. Lamola, I need to say that sitting in the civil trial roles, particularly, I do a lot of matters that I do in the civil regional court. And I did not grant high court costs in the matters that I know could, could easily have been dealt with in the regional court. So it is a matter of possibly not granting those high court costs when a matter could easily have been heard in the regional court. I see this happening also with the Rule 50, 43s that are in the high court. These can be easily dealt with in, in the Rule 58 that's done in the civil regional court. There's no need to um, impose such heavy costs on litigants that are already battling. They can just go to the regional civil court and have that matter aired there uh, quickly and efficiently, as much so as in the High Court. Uh, the Praza matters as well. They don't, not all of them belong in the High Court. Uh, Minister of Police matters with civil damage, they don't all belong there. They can be dealt with in the Regional Court, and that makes access to justice much more feasible and much easier for litigants. It makes it easier for them to just get their matters resolved quickly. Thank you, Chief Justice. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Commissioner Nkosi Thomas. Thank you, Chief Justice. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Commissioner Nkosi Thomas. Uh, the AFT National, in their feedback to us, it's generally complimentary, but then they raise an issue about your experience in constitutional and administrative law. And they say that it is far from satisfactory, it's far from being satisfactory. So I would like you to please comment on that so that uh, we you. understand what the situation is in that regard. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, I thank you for that question. Firstly, I have had opposed matches. One was the DPP valuers, where it dealt with the uh, Paja Act and Section 172 of the Constitution. As a regional magistrate, people forget that section 35 of the constitution needs to be upheld frequently as well, which is all relating to the rights of the accused. 
as well as Section 28 of the Constitution, specifically in sexual offences, where you need to deal with the rights which are paramount to the interests of the child. People forget that we are applying that on a daily basis. Um, as I said, I'm currently dealing with a complex matter which deals with Chapter 7 of the Constitution and the, uh, and the rights of the um, municipalities, local authorities. So I've not delivered this judgment, but I'm handing this judgment down. Thank you. Thanks, Chief Justice. Thank you, SC. Uh, Commissioner Sigolo. Thank you, Chief Justice. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioner Sigolo. The, the GCB commented on your application, and in their conclusion, they say they do not believe your appointment will contribute to the project to transform the judiciary. I'll need your comment. Thank you, Commissioner. As I said pr uh, previously, the, the um, Section 174, 1 and 2 are paramount. Uh, they're imperative that uh, the, G G uh, the G Judicial Service Commission considers us. The aggregate composition of a particular office is to be decided by this, um, by this body. Um, I, I cannot change the fact that I'm a white male. However, what I can change is what, I've, what have I done as a white male in my past. And I've tried to explain to you that uh, I have a vision of transformation which started many years ago and is continuing. So that is what I give back to this community. Uh, and I think also my knowledge of possibly what I've seen in other countries to ameliorate and expedite access to justice, I think this is also something that I can uh, contribute to this uh, formation of a more efficient uh, judicial system. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chief Justice. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner. Uh, Honorable Malema. Commissioner Malema. You're not honorable here. Yes, I'll call you. Uh, I'll address you differently. Yes. Uh, thank you, CJ. Um, you said some story about the first time you went to Soweto. I would want you to briefly. Uh, I repeat that so All right. we can be on the same page. Okay. Commissioner Malema started, I was part of a singing group in the 1989-1990. And um, yes, I was a privileged white in the sense that I had a, a car which was a hand-me-down from my dad to my mom to my sister to me. But I had wheels and I would take my fellow students into Orlando. In those years it wasn't very favorable to go into Orlando. I didn't think of that in those years. It, didn't, it wasn't something that bothered me. What was important to me is that I had friends and we would go and record in the homes in Orlando music. We, we enjoyed it. It was for me uh, a passion. And that is where my first um, experience and uh, understanding of what was happening in, in Soweto took place. Does transformation mean a white male can be appointed? I, I think transformation, as I've said before, means you need to appoint a white male, if you are going to consider that, who has a vision for transformation, namely bringing uh, some change in the uh, commitment of, of, of not just that white male's understanding, but his ability to bring in the ethos and understanding of constitutional principles into the way things are done, and also an empathy for the people. Um, I need to explain that in those 12 years that I was in Soweto, I was warmly received, and still to this date, I, I'm, I'm still very much in touch with Soweto. For me, it's, it's my passion. I go in there very often still. Um, and because I don't have children, uh, for me, um, in the years of, of going into Otandweni with the children's home, or many years ago with Carl Sitoli, it's, it's just my ability to interact. And I don't say that a white male cannot be appointed. It has to be a white male who has a vision uh, a vision for what is of interest in this country and what do we need in this country. I think colour is, is, not, is, is an issue, yes, for purposes of uh, Section 174, 1 and 2. But apart from that, it is the actual inner body of this person and what can that person bring. Thank you. Uh, JP, JP. Thank you, Chief Justice. You've been on the bench for a number of years now. Is that correct? Um, that's correct. My concern is more practical. Both 
criminal and civil trials, when they actually run, do not finish within the allocated time. And you either end up with partly heard matters. What's your suggestion or plan to deal with that? Well, first of all, it is not uh, favorable to have part heard civil matters, firstly. Unfortunately, I got two in this uh, second term, and that is purely because litigants don't always understand or fully acknowledge how long that matter will take. So it is inevitable that if you cannot accommodate it in the two days that they've set down, it becomes a part of matter. But when witnesses are to be called, you cannot really dictate to the parties to not call witnesses. It's not a, an inquisitorial system that we have in this country. So if you have not um, been involved in the pre-trial of this particular matter, as per the uh, Rule 37 of the, um, of the High Court practice or the pre-trials in the Civil Regional Court, you're not going to be able to curtail that civil trial. But if you have been engaged in, in assessing how to curtail the civil trial at an early stage, then you can uh, eradicate unnecessary interlocutories or try and find what are the expedient necessary factors that need to be considered in, in the trial itself, um, separation of quantum merits, those can definitely expedite civil matters. In regard to criminal matters, I think you need to be very uh, firm uh, when it comes to criminal trials, because those really can drag on. And if you do not keep your hand on the pulse, finger on the pulse, these matters are going to drag on. So I always am very uh, firm with those matters to try and encourage, not in an unpleasant way, but to try and bring it to the knowledge of the legal counsel that are representing accused that, please, we need to finalize this matter because it's in the interest of justice to do so. Um, it's a matter of being in control and being a leader to mastermind the finalization of these cases. Second question. <clears throat> Our sentencing regime. You spend many years in the criminal courts. Do you think that the way we sentence offenders in South Africa really do act as a deterrent? If not, what do you suggest? Well, prior to 2008, we didn't have the minimum prescribed sentences. And these were, um, sorry, 90, prior to 1998, sorry, we didn't have the prescribed minimum sentences. The, the fact that we have minimum prescribed sentences, there's, there's two bodies of thought that you actually remove the discretion that a magistrate or judge has in imposing a sentence because there's minimum sentences that are applicable. But this, the, the fact remains that if you do have a surge of certain types of matters, you need to, uh, unfortunately, sentence criminals with the severity of the crime they have committed. The, um, the problem there is that not everyone applies the same minimum sentences. And that's possibly where we should have a commission, a sentencing commission, to keep control of this, because in that way then we could um, keep tabs and maybe it would have a, a deterrent effect if everyone was imposed with similar sentences. Obviously, notwithstanding, you cannot exclude the personal circumstances of any individual. Thank you, JP. Your excuse, sir. Thank you so much for Thank coming. You. Thank you.